Where are we at? I'm I'm of the opinion that a Corvette really needs round tail lights, but I know that that's you guys don't necessarily agree. All right, you know that's why we're having this discussion. That's the only thing you can complain about on this car. It, no, there's more, but I'm going to start at the back and work my way forward. The Corvette guys uh, will talk about these traditional Corvette design elements uh, until they're blue in the face, but the reality of it is most of them weren't consistent throughout the entire uh, age of the Corvette. But at the same time. It, it has to be the hardest job in the GM design universe to try and design a, a, a new Corvette because there's all this history and hubris that if you let it, locks you in and really limits your creativity. Welcome to my life at RV. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you have a conversation about a Corvette, it always ends with, for the money. Good car for the money, a lot of performance for the money. This car, if I was running Chevrolet, I wouldn't want this car to stand on its own Ford tire, so to speak, and say, great car, end of mm -hmm. conversation. Well, I think they made a global car for them. I think they made a car that could be in Europe on the streets with a Ferrari. Did they maybe go too European in the styling of this car? Uh, did they soften it a little too much? Does it have enough Americanness? I don't think so. Uh, I think, honestly, this car exudes badass. I mean, they really just kind of sculpted it more. I mean, it still has the this basic silhouette of the Corvettes we all know and love. But they just really honed in, sculpted in more, gave it a lot more angles, gave it a meaner look, and I think it's benefiting from that. Yeah, even though the, if you look at the front three quarter of that and a Ferrari you know, 458 right now, they look, if, if you squint, they're the same car. The engineers at GM, the engineers at Ferrari, they're all pursuing the same goals in terms of aerodynamics, in terms of a wide stance and track performance. You know, and they've got a meet cafe yeah, regulations. And right now, I think the answer, three quarters is, yeah, this car looks great and it has a ton of potential. The last quarter can only be answered when they let us drive the car, mm -hmm. which is still several months away. But I think there's a certain point, though, where if you want to make comparisons to Ferrari and Porsche and those people, a lot of what makes those cars what they are is the snob appeal, the fact that it costs you know, excellent cost, one hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars, and the Corvette at fifty thousand dollars is never going to be as exclusive. But to me, that's what I like about it. That's what I think a lot of Corvette guys like about it is, you know, these guys with their fancy Ferraris or whatever are getting spanked on track days by the guy in the Z06 or the guy in the ZR1. Ferrari guys don't go to track days anyway. No. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's got to be one of the primary goals of the Corvette buyer not getting any younger. Like the younger people want a two-seater sports car, you know, that costs $60,000. They don't, it doesn't not, make I mean, sense. It's like the younger buyer, you think, and those are mostly sport yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm talking so, like 50. Well, I was going to say, yeah. I think younger is a relative term right. when you're, you're talking about Corvette. They're not going to go after the 25 to 30 year old guys. Today's average buyer age is probably 60. Right. And if they could move that needle down to 55, or even 50, they'd be a lot happier. I And I, I see this car visually, at least to me, and interior-wise, to me, I could see that car pushing that number down. I think I think it's more aggressive looking. It's, like I said, it's more avant-garde. Does anybody think that it's the Stingray based on the looks of it? Would you have put a Stingray there? No. 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 I like the Stingray bag. But I don't know what that means. Yeah. I like well, it too. It you know, I think we gotta drive it first to really get a feel for it if it, lives up to the Stingray name, but you know, the, the cool thing about that car is, you know, you saw it and you're like, that is badass. You get but a similar I, emotional reaction, you know, to the old, from the old Stingray to this Stingray. You look at it and you're just, you feel like you're instantly connected to it. You want to hop in, you want to drive the dang thing. That's kind of the essence of the Stingray name. A more, um, I guess, a more of an emotional impact. I will say that I thought it was interesting when we voted uh, this car best in show the other day. There was no other car nominated, and I mean that whole process took five seconds. It was unanimous. In the last few years, what other car that we've seen do you think could have beat it for a best in show? That's the thing, I don't really know. It was everything that you want in a Detroit Auto Show car. It was everything, and it fulfilled that role you know, magnificently. This truly feels like it's a big leap ahead to a C7. It's a completely new generation. There is a hard break between the generations of these cars. Yeah, the interior alone is a huge jump for him. I mean, that we, every time Wes wrote something about the Corvette, he dogged the interior. So 
this well, is a Wes wasn't killer. the only one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not like I invented that. <laughs> Previous generation vets, which can be comfortable because we've taken them on short and long trips, but they always had this sort of aura of being a GM parts bin car. Because it's a small volume program, they weren't going to get a lot of money to tool up a lot of their own bits. They had to use what they could from other programs. You get into the you get into the C7. There are two eight-inch video monitors in there, one behind the steering wheel, one in the dash. There's thickly bolstered seats. There's aluminum and leather and carbon fiber trim all over the place. This is not a GM parts bin interior. Other cars that have this much power have things like all-wheel drive to get that power down to the ground and to be able to use all that power. Corvette is just rear drive. So you got all that power and what's it doing? It's making smoke. Now everybody likes to do that. You know, there's nothing like a smoky tire burnout, but wouldn't this car be even better and be a world-class car if you could get that power down and use it? I, for 450 horsepower with all-wheel drive with the traction control off smokes all four tires. Just the same, but, you know, to a lesser degree. It's the same principle. It's the same thing, it's just to a lesser degree. I don't think the Corvette's ever going to be considered a serious world-class performance That's machine it. without dual overhead camshaft. I mean, it's just, it's, but it, it doesn't make sense. They win races year after year after year with it. Well, I'm well, not advocating push. Out, well, not Audi, advocating well, push. Audi I'm and BMW are trying to figure out a way to get a longer and longer timing yes. chain in their engine. But that hurts the reputation Chevy of is building the a, a better, more powerful engine Small block that's Chevy lighter is not, and more useful. It's not a supercar engine. Well, it, I know, know it is, I know it is, but it in is. the minds of people with $100,000 to spend. Why not a dual clutch transmission? Because they're awful. No, they're, they're awful. awful. Tad Jucker, the chief engineer, said he couldn't find a transmission, a dual clutch unit, that would handle the torque of the engine and fit into the space he had in the rear transaxle of the car. Yeah, I think it's oh, going to yeah. definitely live up to that. I think it's going to be a fantastic car. The, but it comes down to the point: do I do I want one? And the answer is still not really. Oh, it's a beautiful, beautiful car, and it's if it performs half as well as it looks, I think it'll be great.